All right, thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. Well, you've heard the expression, bring it on home. Well, our guest today is bringing nature home. Uh, we're joined by uh, Douglas Talmy. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. And he's the author of a groundbreaking book called Bringing Nature Home. And we're thrilled to have you on the program. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm very pleased to be here. Now, the, the, the essence of the book really is the, the notion that we need to uh, take our monocultural backyards. With, and front yards. And front yards, <laughs> okay, we'll do that. We'll go, we'll go the whole gamut here. Do the here. whole thing, right. Yeah. Uh, do the whole thing and convert them into wildlife habitats. Yeah, and, and that doesn't sound, uh, it's not as drastic as it sounds, is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. We've got to abandon the notion of humans here and nature someplace else, because now humans are pretty much everywhere. Exactly. Uh, and we are not going to do well on this planet if we eliminate nature. So we need to, we need to learn to live with it, and the book really is, is making some, describing why we need to learn to live with it, why we actually need other, other living things, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know, some basics about how to go about that. Yeah. But we're not talking about a sacrifice here. No. We might sacrifice some of the square footage of, of uh, lawn that mm -hmm. we have, 45.6 million acres, by the way. <laughs> um, I think that's enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, lawn is a status symbol. Mm -hmm. and Has that's, been for millennia, I that's, guess. That's fine, but we, <laughs> let's change our status symbol. Let's get bigger belt buckles or something and, and, and trade in some of the, the lawn. And then we can... We, we really can create enough mm -hmm. uh, viable habitat. All mm -hmm. we need is, is food. And if you put mm -hmm. the proper plants in your yard, they're generating the food. And then all the things that, that uh, and that food largely is insects. That's what yeah. we're talking about. Sure. And all the things that eat insects come in. And, you know, we're largely talking about birds, too. Sure, so. sure. Well, and, you know, I think birds are an appropriate status symbol to brag that you uh, have uh, three right. dozen species that exactly. uh, regularly visit your backyard. Uh, right. I, that we're turning into a bird or nation. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. And, and the real key is to get them to breed in your yard. Um, mm -hmm. Visiting is, is okay as long as they have some other place to go, but when they don't, they need to breed there. Mm -hmm. So what do you need to do? Provide shelter. You, you need to provide shelter, but basically food. If, mm -hmm. if you want a pair of chickadees in your yard, you need to provide between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees. That's a lot of That's caterpillars. That's a lot of caterpillars. <laughs> That's right. But, but, you know, they will eat that many, mm -hmm. and then you won't have 6,000 caterpillars in your yard. So right. people worry, oh, they'll eat me out of house and home. You won't be able to find any mm -hmm. because the birds eat a tremendous number. Yeah. Well, you know, it's amazing. You, you talk about uh, we need the insects. But, uh, of course, uh, that's one thing that makes a lot of uh, people extremely squeamish. The idea of any, I remember 20 or 30 years ago, I've been doing radio call-in programs for that long, any insect was bad. Right. That, that has been our culture. So let's not call them insects, let's call them bird food. <laughs> uh, we put out bird seed all winter long, hoping to right. feed the birds. Now we're going to plant plants. It's free bird seed. It's free bird seed. <laughs> well, birds don't rear their young on seed. They rear their young on insects. 96% mm -hmm. of our birds are relying on those insects. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you put plants in your yard like, like crepe myrtle, doesn't make any insects. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful plant, but it's, it's biologically dead. It's inert. I think of it as a statue. You know, mm. a couple statues are okay, but when the entire community is a statue, um, everything else leaves. Okay. If everything else leaves from the planet, we're going to leave too. So, yeah. all right. Well, let's talk about the importance of, of all this diversity right outside of our, our back and front doors. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is the diversity piece of it so important? Don't I mean? There's. I look around my neighborhood. There's a lot of different stuff in my neighborhood. Right. You know? Right. Uh, diversity is important as long as it's contributing diversity. So we have a large number of species of plants that are from, from Asia. Mm -hmm. They're contributing very little to our local food webs. Okay. Um, so that's the statue concept. That, yeah. that diversity is not going to help hold those food webs together. Mm -hmm. We need diversity because it's, it is biodiversity. It is other living things that run the ecosystems that support us. We used to rely on nature to provide all of those ecosystem services there's not enough nature left anymore. Look at the light map of the U.S. And, yes, and you get a good yeah. feeling for, for uh, yeah. where people are and where they aren't. And where they aren't, you know, is agriculture. Mm -hmm. We have 770 million acres of rangeland here. So where are we going to put, put nature? We've got to put it back where we are, where mm -hmm. we're living. And it has to be diverse. So we have to create the ecosystem services, the mm -hmm. clean water, the oxygen, the sequestered carbon, the pollinators, all the other things. 
right in our yards. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the, the question of exotic plants. Um, this has become a very prominent subject here in Austin. Lots of invasives that have, have moved beyond our yards into mm -hmm. wildlife habitat and, and in our parks, et cetera. Um, how, is it really that big of an issue? It's, it's huge. We have over 3,300 species of invasive plants in this country. Uh, the definition of invasive is it has to be non-native and it's displacing native plant communities. Mm -hmm. um, Eighty-five percent of the woody invasive plants in this country are escapees from our garden. Mm -hmm. So it's no mystery where these plants have come from. We're, we're selling them in our nurseries. Mm -hmm. And we always start out by saying it's not invasive. Well, it's not invasive yet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it is, and we say, well, we'll stop selling it. Well, it's too late. Then. Exactly. Too late. Yeah. yeah, I've encountered that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's that cute little plant? Okay, it's not invasive. Right. And now it's uh, but, six blocks away. <laughs> but see, you can, you can abandon the invasive concept and say, it's in my yard. The, when 80% when of the plants in your yard are from Asia, and that's the way it is where I come from, mm -hmm. whether they're invasive or not, they're the first trophic level in your yard. They're either providing those services or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a you have a, a very non-functional ecosystem when right. your plants are from outside of your local food web. So uh, obviously a very strong proponent of native plants. Native plants and productive native plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm certainly Mr. Native Plant Guy, but all native plants are not contributing equally. Mm -hmm. And some contribute very little. Others contribute tremendous amounts. And mm. oaks oaks lead that that parade. They are number one in supplying food, sequestered carbon, storing water, doing all of those things. Well, you're so, in the oak capital of the world you, right here in go. central Texas. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, a native plant doesn't have to be ugly. Uh, mm, and it no. can be highly functional. <laughs> right. Um, but, but uh, you know, poison ivy's a native plant too. And <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Now let's talk yeah. about, I mean, uh, here in, in uh, our area, native plants have been uh, embraced for decades now right and a lot of people are experimenting with them and creating cultivars and hybrids is that a good thing <laughs> that's the most common question I get uh, and the the straight answer is we don't know yet because nobody's done the research mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can make predictions it depends on what the genetic change is that creates the cultivar if you're changing the flower you're very likely changing the energy budget the nectar load that the pollinators depend on and most, most of our cultivars do focus on flowers. Mm -hmm. If you're making a tall plant short, does it change the leaf chemistry so caterpillars can't, can't use it anymore? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're starting research uh, programs uh, to, to look at that, and in a couple of years we'll have, have the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, two other things. If you have a choice of a, a cultivar of a native plant mm -hmm. and your crepe myrtle, take the cultivar. But I wish we would do a better job of selling the straight species, at least offering them in the marketplace, right. so people have the option. I think that's a, per a perfectly appropriate response. Now, let's talk about, uh, you know, sometimes we have, uh, we create habitat, we invite wildlife in, but sometimes the wildlife might become problematic. And that is certainly the case uh, in central Texas where we have the largest deer herd in North America roaming around. Um, Boy, larger than ours? That's hard I, to believe. <laughs> they're smaller deer, but there are a lot of them. We have 140 <laughs> per square acre per, per, per square mile. Well, per square mile. It's, yeah. uh, it's... 14 it, times over the carrying capacity. But you know, what we've done, mm -hmm. we've fiddled with nature again. We have eliminated the top predators. We brought in part of nature and left the other part out. Mm -hmm. It's not how nature works. We need top predators controlling everything below them. Uh, so we need healthy first trophic levels and healthy top trophic levels. If we've eliminated the predators, we're going to have to be the predators. You can't. There's, you know, it's not the deer, the deer's fault. But they, Bambi. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can starve Bambi, or we can control Bambi. Okay. And or we can put the wolves back. Any, I'll take any one. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might have, they, they have a hard enough time with the caterpillars. The wolves might be a little <laughs> tricky. I understand that. <laughs> I understand. It. It's not that we don't know what to do with the deer, okay. but we've created an unsustainable situation. All right. Well, Doug Tallamy, thank you so much for being our guest. <laughs> You're uh, quite the book, welcome. again, is Bringing Nature Home. Uh, we hope a lot of people will heed your advice. Thank you. Right, and coming up next is our friend Daphne.